Good morning, God's people. How are you this morning? Let's get on our feet and we welcome God's presence and we praise God and we give all our praise and worship. Praise be to God. How awesome is your name. We proclaim in one voice. Forever, ever, your kingdom reigns. To God be the glory. Amen.
you for joining us this morning. Before we start our announcements, make sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, do follow us on our Facebook and Instagram page to stay updated with our latest news. To find out more about us, you can check out our website at www.churchonphrase.my. Let's move on to our announcements. First, do join us every Wednesday and Saturdays for our weekly prayer meeting. These meetings will be held on Zoom. Wednesday meetings are at 8 p.m. while Saturday meetings are at 8.45 a.m. Cutting Edge Youth meetings are on every Saturday at 4 p.m. You may get the Zoom links through the youth leaders or their Instagram at ce.youth. You may even head to their Facebook group to find out more about them. Trailblazer services alternate between Zoom and YouTube. This week, the children will be on Zoom at 4 p.m. Do get the links of your cell leaders or from our Church of Praise Equal closed group. See you kids there! Lastly, as you may know, Church of Praise Equal is having a food donation program. Over the past few weeks, we have helped at least 60 households. Indeed, it's been a blessing to be able to help those in need. If you wish to continue supporting us, you may do so by scanning the QR code and do label your givings as food donation. Now, it's time for offering. Lord, we thank you that even in this time of pandemic, there is still a food and a comfortable home to live in. Although some may be struggling, but I pray that you continue reminding us that you are in control. May you come and relieve the worried hearts as we know that you will never abandon us, your children. Lord, as we give our offering, we pray that this offering will be able to bless more people and may you continue also blessing us, O oh Lord. Lord, when I commit this tithes and offering into your hands, in Jesus' name I pray, Amen. Good morning. We are at the communion today. Shall we all pray? Lord, you encourage us to come before the table of the Lord in a manner that is worthy of thee, recognizing the bread and the wine for it for which it represents. As we hold the bread in our hands, we encourage every one of you, family, to have bread and wine in your house and we partake of it together. Okay? I'll give you a few moments. And we hold the bread in our hands to recognize the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross where he was broken so that we can be made whole. He was torn, he was persecuted so that we can be made whole once again. Thank you, Lord, for your precious blood. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice that you have made us all one. Father, forgive us of our sin and cleanse us, O God, as we partake of the bread together. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, this is a new, this is a my body which is broken for you. As you partake of it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together. Lord, as we hold a cup, we are reminded of the words of Jesus when he said, This is a new covenant in my blood. In Bible days, how they have sacrificed, they bring animals, they bring turtle doves as a sacrifice for the sin. But Jesus died on the cross once and for all. He became a sacrifice for all of us. Lord, we thank you for what you have done on the cross. You were sacrificed so that we can be made well. Lord, as we partake of the wine, Bless the wine, bless each one of us as you have forgiven us and cleansed us. In Jesus' name we pray. In the same manner, you said, you took a cup and you said, This is a new covenant in my blood. 
as often as you partake of it, do it in rem remembrance of me till I shall come again. Thank you, Lord, for the wine which you have given us. We partake of it together. Amen. Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them as he passed by. He saw Levi the son of Ephesus sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unstrung cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins, or else the new wine bursts the wine skins. The wine is spilled, and the wine skins are ruined. The new wine must be put into new wine skins. Hi, Shalom, Church of Praise. May the peace of God that surpasses all understandings guards your hearts. How are, how are you during this lockdown? Do you feel locked in or do you feel locked out? Sometimes when situations like this happen, especially negative situations when it is prolonged, all right, longer, it is, longer than what it is supposed to be, we, we begin to de develop a certain sense of uneasy feeling, restless, and then we can feel frustrated or depressed or actually finally hopeless. Sometimes we can feel Hello, this is really hopeless case, man. You know, we can feel like that. But today I want to bring before you what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, talking about the hope of God. Today I want to share with you about this God-given hope for us. We'll look at the title here. This is God-given hope for each one of us. This can be found actually uh, in the book of Jeremiah, but this is particularly the background. The background here is God is speaking to them that uh, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. These are plans that are for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. This is good plan God has for us. Plan that is for our welfare, our well-being, and not for our disaster. It is supposed to give us a good future and also a good hope. Now, this is talking, God really, really feeling very, very hopeless. Why? This group of Israelites, because of war, all right, they got to face 
the exile of their whole family, their whole tribe, their whole people group. They are all supposed to just follow the troop and go to where? Go to Babylon. Babylon from Jerusalem is about 2,700 kilometers and is on foot. On foot. You see, because of war, Babylon has overtaken Israel. And this is their fate. This is their fate. They have no choice. They are the captives of war and they are supposed to be exiled to a foreign land. A land that pray to idols, a land that eat food offered to idols. And then this is really hopeless, like, like a death sentence, right? Like a death sentence. We are going to leave all our homes, our gardens, all that we planted, our nice furniture, our family members, and we, will, we may have to part our way along the way. We may lose each other, but we are going to take the march. All of us are going to take the march towards Babylon, 2,700 kilometers. Of course, you know, those days there's no GPS. Nobody know how far. All right? They just know it's hot, hotter and hotter. And the, the path is going to be really tough. We do not know how much the, even the elderly people can take it. God, through Jeremiah, was really, really speaking to a hopeless group of people. People who feel that they have nowhere to go, this is their fate. That's why a group of them, when they could, they actually flee to Egypt. But the rest of them, they have no other choice. They got to take this route towards east to Babylon, so-called their new home. But before they left, God keep reminding them, I have a good plan for you. Oh, this is something they cannot understand. We are going to a foreign land. We are going to eat foreign food, have foreign people, foreign God, and we are going to lose everything that we have in this land that we, that we have worked so hard for. And you say you got a good plan for us. Now, this is something which is very, very hard. Now, but why at this point, they seemingly are receiving discipline from the Lord and punishment from the Lord instead of well-being, instead of a well and good hope. Now, so God, God promised them he wants to give them a good hope. Now, what is hope? Now, hope commonly, usually when we use the word hope, oh, I hope I can fly soon. I hope I can get out of the house soon and have my, you know, one tummy or whatnot. Hope is commonly used to say, I wish for something. How strong can your hope be? The, the strength of the hope depends on one person's desire. If his desire is strong, his dream is strong, I want to have this, I hope to have this home, I hope to have this house, I work very hard for it. The strength of his hope depends on his desire. But today when the Bible talks about hope, it is not a hope that depends on how strong my desire is, but the hope is in our confident expectation of what God has promised and what God can do. So the strength of our hope is not on how strong I am. The strength of our hope is in God's faithfulness. How big our God is, all right? How mighty our God is. Our hope is a confident one. We are expecting for something good because God said it and he will do it. All right? Again and again, whatever he promised, he has done it. Right? Now, let's look at the next slide. This next slide actually gives us a little glimpse uh, of what this Paul Lindsay say. Give us a little glimpse of how important hope is. Of course, this, this might be a little exaggerated. Uh, he said, men can live about 40 days without food. Now, Jesus did it, and there are other people who have done it. Uh, men can live about three days without water, maybe about eight minutes without air. And now we are very aware of this with air and without air. We, are, we, we know that very well. Eight minutes without air, we are gone. He said, but when a person has no hope just for a second, gone case. When a person, there and then at a moment feel, this is totally hopeless. And he may just end his life. 
he may just do something foolish, all because he felt this is the end of the world. This is so hopeless. Now, so the Israelites, when they are walking towards Babylon, this can be their feeling. God is punishing us. God is disciplining us. But today, we want to look at 3C. We want to look at 3C of why are these things happening and what is the reason behind it and how does God want us to turn around, to, for this whole thing to turn around for our good. Now, the first C we want to look at is the cost of action. The cost of action. What is the cost of action here? Of course, Jeremiah at the time, he has preached to the Israelites for 40 years. Brothers and sisters, not four days, not, not 40 months, you know, it's 40 years. And he has served, and by the time that he was serving, it was already the fifth king. And the kings were based, most of them, all of the five kings, four of the kings were evil. And Jeremiah preached for 40 years. Very, very few people believe what he said. And very, very few people obey to what the Lord tell him to say. Now, let's look at uh, what was the condition of the, of the people of Israel at that point. In, according to Jeremiah 2, 17 and 19, the people had abandoned God. And they have rebelled against God. 17 says, you have brought this upon yourself. By what? Rebelling against the Lord your God. Even though he was leading you on the way. God was already leading you. But you are still rebelling against him. Say so your wickedness will bring this. Your wickedness will bring its own punishment. Your turning from me will shame you you will see what an evil, bitter thing it is to abandon the Lord your God and not to fear Him. I, the Lord, the Lord your God, is the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. The Lord of heaven's army is the Lord of hosts. All right? He is the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Sabot. He said, Jehovah Sabot say, I am speaking to you. You have abandoned me and you have rebelled against me. How? Because they were praying to idols. Idol worshipping was flourishing. They even to that extent everywhere they have shrine where they actually worship idols and they even sacrifice children. All right? They were idolatrous and they were so different, so different against God. And even the law of God, the law of God through Moses was disregarded and disobeyed. That's why they rebel against God, doing the things that they want, which was disgusting activities or indulgence in sin, which the Lord was definitely not pleased with. All right, now, now let, let's look at the next slide. What else happened? Now, beside them uh, worshipping idols and rebelling against God, the second thing they did was they, they were alliance with the ungodly. They align with the ungodly. Say, so what have you gained by your alliances with Egypt and covenants with Assyria? What good to you are the streams of Nauz or the waters of the Euphrates River? Because when they were facing the enemy's attack, the enemy was pressing him to attack them, what do they do? Instead of turning to God, they turn to their neighbor, the stronger, the stronger nation. Come on, come on, let's join force and let's fight. And that was how Josiah, Josiah, even though he was a godly king, he actually gave in to this temptation and also, he also did the same thing. He went and allied himself with the ungodly nation. He was killed very quickly in the war. All right, it was King Josiah. Supposed to, be, supposed to be the only godly king at that time. And verse 36 says, first here, first here you ally with this, this nation. There, then there another one. He said, you flirt from one ally to another, asking for help. But your new friends in Egypt will let you down, just as Assyria did before. He said, all of this 
You think you can you can befriend them? You think they can be uh, your unless you have God at your side, the Lord of hosts at your side, you will never win the warfare. You must remember before all these kings uh, was established, there were the time of judges. If you were to notice, every warfare the children of Israel fight or the children of Israel fought, God actually fought for them. God actually fought for them. If you look at, you study all of the warfare, God actually could take over all of this for them. But yet they did not remember the history. They did not learn from their forefathers. They, they try to find people that they can gang with and let's fight somebody else. But so they turn away from God. They rebel against God. They worship other idols. And also instead of turning to God for help, they turn, they turn to other nations for help. And this is in Jeremiah 2, 11, how God described, how God described what they have done. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11 in our next uh, slide, it shows here, God was speaking from his heart. He said, has any nation ever traded his God for another one? Or even though they are not gods at all, you see, has any nation, any country changed their God? Okay, I, I, I changed your God. I changed my God. You change, you, you, you change, has changed with me. He said, no, there is no any nation that has exchanged their God for somebody else's God. He said, yet my people has exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Worthless idols, they know very well. All right, they knew very well. These are all made in with hand. King David has already written it long before this time. These are all made of wood. These are all made of clay. These are all made of gold or silver. They are not true God. They are, they are man-made. He said, you have exchanged the, the glory of God for worthless idols. Now, can you imagine of the things that they have done, how much shame and how much pain it has brought to God. All right? And God said, this is the cause. This is the cause of my action. So I'm allowing you to be exiled. All right? I'm allowing you to be exiled to Babylon. I'm allowing you to be taken by your enemy. What is this? This is like a discipline. This is a discipline. This is a punishment. The Lord said, yes, go ahead and go. But yet at the same time, the, Jeremiah, now we will remain here. Yet Jeremiah said, when you go to Babylon, settle there. This is God's instruction because that's according to Jeremiah 29 verse 4 to verse 7. He says, when you go there, build home there. Have your garden there. Eat the fruits that, that are there. Don't, tr don't try to think of fruits that are here. He said, marry there and pray for the people there. Pray for the country there. He said, do not, do not think about, do not think of, oh, my country. But wherever you are, pray for the country and bless the country. But was God trying to abandon his people? Was God trying to reject them forever and ever? Not so. This is a time of discipline. This is the cause of action God has taken because, because they have not learned to treasure their God. Because they have not learned to value the true and living God. Instead, they have exchanged it from, for things, for items that they can touch with their own hand. And God has allowed them through this discipline, through this punishment, this is temporal. The reason is so that he can purify your life. Now, we want to look at the second C that we have right now. The second C is God's covenant action. Actually, before even he spoke on Jeremiah 29 verse 11, that he has a good plan and a good hope for, for them, in Jeremiah 29 verse 10, actually, he says, he says, 
does say the Lord, when this 70 years has been completed for the Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you and to bring you back to this place. Can you see? Before he even mentioned verse 11, his good plan for them, he already said, you will be there for 70 years. 70 years sounds very long. Huh? He said, but God specifically tell them, build house there, marry there, produce there, increase there. He said, but when these 70 years are up, I will come, I will visit you, I will fulfill my good word, and I will bring you back. In the book of Jeremiah itself, all these promises were given. Look at Jeremiah 31 verse 8 in our next slide. Jeremiah 31 verse 8, God says, For I will bring them from the north, and from the far distant corners of the earth, I will not forget even the blind and the lame, the expectant mothers and the women in labor. He said, A great company will return. A great company of Israelites will return. Do you know that until today, the, the Israelites, they are scattered everywhere in every other country. They are still returning to Israel. But of course, at this time, this history did happen. This history did happen. After 70 years, they returned back to Israel. That's why you, you, we, we can see Israel and we can see Jesus being born in Israel. All right. He said, I will bring you back from the north, from the east, from the west, wherever. This, what is this, what is this uh, verse talking about here? This verse is talking about the prophecy. It is talking about a promise. A prophecy of a remnant. A prophecy of a group of people that will remain, that will survive this Babylon exile or this Babylonian raid, and they will return. Yes, there will be a group of people, the younger ones, they, they, can, be, they can also survive past the Babylonians' uh, 70 years. You understand? So this is a promise and this is a prophecy of the remnant that will return. Now look at Jeremiah 31 verse 10, another promise from the word of God. Jeremiah 31 verse 10, he says, listen to this message from the Lord. Okay, you listen, all right? It's a new, new nation of the world. Proclaim it in distant coastland. The Lord who scatter his people will gather them and watch over them as the shepherd does his flock. Every night, the shepherd will bring back the flock. He said, this is exactly what I will do. When they have enough of food out there, it's time to bring them back. I will bring them back. He said, listen to this message. He is now proclaiming it to the nation. He is now proclaiming it to the world, to the distant land. He said, the people that I have scattered, I will bring them back. Exactly like a very responsible shepherd, then I will bring them back. And when I bring them back, what more? Much more things are going to happen. Look at 31 verse 13. He said, the young woman will dance for joy. All right? And the young man, and the men also, old and young, they will join in the celebration. They'll be dead, dancing away. I, he said, I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and exchange their sorrow for rejoicing. Now, if you take time to look at the whole book of Jeremiah, whole chapter of Jeremiah 31, you will be filled with joy, exuberant kind of joy. Because this is really talking about their future will be much, much glorious and much, much majestic than right now. Much, much glorious than right now. He, you will even see that in this, in this book, he even has promised the future king, the future testament. He said this future king is going to come. And there's going to, this new dynasty is going to be greater than the dynasty right now. You think your king was great? He said, you are going to see a great king, this future king coming. His dynasty, his rule, his reign is going to be much more glorious and much more majestic. Right? 
So brothers and sisters, I tell you all this to say what? God is a covenant giving God. Whatever that we are going through, remember this. Whatever we are going through right now, remember that God is a righteous and just God. He is righteous and just. He will not allow sin to prevail. All right? But yet we know that God is full of love. He is full of grace. His discipline and his judgment is always redemptive. When he disciplined you, when he disciplined me or judged us, it is never to destroy us. It is never to put us away. away. It is never to shame us so badly that we are beyond redemption. No. Our God is righteous and just, but yet he's full of love. He's full of grace. Whatever discipline that he needs to take as a father, it is always redemptive. It is always mean to save us, always mean to redeem us. But there's something that we want to look at the third C. In this third C, we want to see the course of action God wants us to take. Now, we have learned that God's course of action was because of their rebellion. But God did not just discipline them. He rose up and give them a covenant action that he wants to make with them. And now, he has something for us, each one of us to do. Of course, for people then, and also for people now. He wants us to take a certain course of actions. Now, what is this course of action? Look at Jeremiah 29, verse 12 and verse 13. It says, in those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Or to be amplified, to, to make it even clearer. He said, in those days when you pray to me, when you cry out to me, he say, I will pay attention carefully and I will listen to you carefully. If you look for me with all your heart, you will surely find me. Look at verse, the next verse. Uh, the next verse in 29 uh, verse 14, it says, oh, this is even better. It says, I will be found by you, says the Lord. All right? Say, I will be found by you. I will end your captivity and I will restore your fortune. Restore your fortune. And I will gather you out of the nation where I send you and I'll bring you home again to your own land. I'll bring you back to your own land and I will restore your fortune. Last time you got a house, huh? you will have a house when you go back. He said, but to me, the best statement in, in this whole verse is first, first line. He says, I will be found by you. Jehovah God chose to be found by us. He, you know, it is not a hide and seek, you know, where he hide himself somewhere. Then you need to cry out to him. You need to knock. You need to seek. And then you look for him. No. He says, when you cry out to me with all your heart, you will definitely find, find me because I choose to be found by you. The Lord said, I choose to be found by you. I will set you free from this captivity and I will restore you. So what do you think should the Israelites' attitude be? Now God has promised them. God said, yes, I am disciplining you. Yes, I'm sending you there for 70 years, but please live there peacefully and pray for the peace of their country. After 70 years, the remnant will return. All of you, all right? Whether you're strong, healthy, or you're lame or blind, I will take you home. I will take you home. And when I've taken you, I mean, when they hear all of this, what do you think their attitude should be? Sulking away 70 years. I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose my beautiful uh, pomegranate I have planted, la, the fig tree. The fix, la, I, I won't get to enjoy la, 70 years. But God gave them a number. Can you imagine there's a number given? Right now, we don't even have a number given to us. Do you know that? We don't even have a number. This is a number given to them so they can prepare themselves. 70 years, I'll be here. What should I do? What should I do with my children, my grandchildren? How should I prepare them? But what about today? What should our attitude be? 
Now there we are exiled. All right. Now let's look at our. This looks like a difficult situation. This uh, they give us an encouragement. When every time when there's something negative happen, look like a real bad tragedy, to turn our tragedy into triumph. Learn to accept the situation courageously. I'm already in this. Face it positively. Don't have a victim mentality. Why me? But even as we face this situation fair and square, we place ourselves in the hands of God. Safest. That's the safest way. All right. To turn all tragedy and all difficult situation into triumph, into victory, learn to first accept our situation, but always turn ourselves towards God. Don't say, "Oh, I accept my situation; I can take care of myself." No, learn to say, "God, I still need you. I give myself into your hand." Last few scriptures that I want to share with you, hopefully, prayerfully, that this can be encouragement to you. The first one, Jeremiah twenty nine verse eleven. This is the Amplified Bible here. It says, "For I know the thoughts and the and the plan that I have for you," says the Lord. My thoughts and my plan for you is for your welfare, your peace, not for evil, to give you hope in your final outcome. Finally, you will see. Actually, it was hope all the way. God have paid paved the way all the way for us. We hope all along the way, when we learn how to turn to Him, turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's where hope is. Turn your eyes upon hope, then you shall see hope. The book of Nahum, chapter one, verse seven, give us a very, very strong promise. He said, "The Lord is good." All right, the Lord is good. He is, he is our strength. He's a, he's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows, he knows who, he knows those who take refuge and trust in him. He knows who, he recognizes, he cares for, and he understands fully those who take refuge and trust in him. He is our stronghold in the time of trouble. All right, and he is good. All right, he is good. All right. So this is the book of Nahum. God said He knows us when we trust in Him. He will care for us, and He will understand our situation fully. Come on, I like this counselor, man. I really like God when when He knows that I'm I'm seeking Him. When He knows that I'm trusting in Him. And he promised me that he will take care of me. He will recognize who I am, and he understand fully the things that I'm going through. The last last scripture verse in Isaiah forty one, verse ten. He said, "Fear not; there is nothing to be afraid of." Okay, he said, "For I am with you. Do not look around you in terror and in dismay, for I am your God." I will strengthen you and harden you to difficulties. Not harden your heart to God, but harden you to difficulties. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up and I'll retain you with my victorious right hand of rightness and justice. Do not fear. There is nothing to fear about. Let is let each one of us lift up our hand, close our eyes. Close our eyes and let me just declare this verse over your life, over your spirit, man. As Isaiah forty-one verse ten says, "Fear not; there is nothing to be fearful about, for God is with you, and you, and you. Do not look around in terror or in dismay, or even in this situation Malaysia in is in right now. Do not look around in terror and in dismay." Have peace in God, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will harden you to all difficulties. Yes, I will help you. I will help you, Church of Praise. Yes, I will hold you up, and I will retain you 
with my victorious right hand. This is not just a right hand, you know. This is a victorious right hand of rightness and justice. Father God, I just want to thank you for again affirming and comforting our heart that we know that you are there and you are always there. The children of Israel have to move out from their home, plucked out from their country land, all the way 2,700 kilometers to a foreign land, to a foreign language, to a foreign group of people. But yet, the Lord took care of them. Father God, is there anything too hard for you? You care for the birds in the sky. You surely care for each one of us. I commit every family to you, every father's especially, who has to take charge of the finance at home, take care of the mothers. Sometimes the mother also have to be there helping with the finance, taking care of the children, studying at home. I pray, oh God, that you will be with your people. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved. Yet you gave to prove your love for me the voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude all that I Thank you.